Wow, thank you. Thank you, Liz. It's a real pleasure to, to follow such uh, esteemed guests, and it's a real honor to be here among so many heroes. And I wrestled with this last night and after the reception and then the, uh, the Blue Drinks um, uh, uh, post-reception. Um, and since we are among family, I thought I'd share a family secret. Um, when I was, let's see here, let's go to the next one here. There we go. <laughs> so, like many kids, I dreamed of being a superhero. And it really <laughs> turns out, though, that I was a Jimmy Olsen. Jimmy Olsen gets to hang out with superheroes. And when I was 14, I really, really wanted to be a journalist. And one of the first things I learned by hanging out at the local newspaper in ninth grade was 80% of success, particularly in journalism and these big stories, is showing up. The other 20%, tough for a 14-year-old, is listening, just listening. Very, very simple. So I always tried to be where things were happening. And what I'm really excited about being in Canada here, and we had a meeting in Al Alberta a couple weeks ago, is Canada is the place to be. It's right here. And I think we know it already that the biggest story of our lifetime is water. When we look at the planet, we have, we look around the world, we do have systems that are failing. In many senses, we have a systemic failure. The US uh, National Intelligence Report last year released a special report on water. So for the first time, at least the first time that we know about it, our intelligence communities globally are starting to look at water, climate change, food and energy and these systemic challenges as national security threats. Really, really serious. Global instability, drought, disruption, security, fragile states, a nexus of water, food and energy. And it connects just about everything we care about. So we see here food, cri food shortage crises, market instability, rising greenhouse gas emissions. We see even massive digital misinformation. How are we going to harness all of this data and use it for really, really critical real-time decisions? But when there's water scarcity, we can also see triggers. We see what happens in other parts of the world when there's less water food prices go up. What happens when food prices go up? People protest. So here's a really interesting chart. The peaks here, you probably can't read the countries, but the peaks here are when food prices go up, the red lines are where demonstrations and where violence occurs. So we can tie violence to food prices. So we can actually start to see food prices correlating to drought, correlating to violence in different parts of the world. So also, the, probably the greatest tragedy on the planet right now today is about 800 million people are without access to adequate, safe drinking water. Now imagine that. You can't turn on your tap. You can't drink the water. If you do drink the water because it's all you have, you're sick. What happens when you're sick? Well, 5,000 children die every day because of their sick, but they're also children like this four-year-old in Ghana who spends six hours a day carrying water. What happens when she has to carry water for that much time? She doesn't go to school. What happens when she doesn't go to school? Her family, she probably doesn't get family education. She probably has a much larger family and perpetuates this insidious cycle. Also in India, now we have to talk about sanitation when we're talking about the global freshwater crisis. There's that other side of it, where about two billion people don't have access to adequate sanitation. Now we were just in Delhi, we spent uh, about four weeks in Delhi doing a scouting trip, which I'll talk about in just a minute. These are women who are waiting to use the toilet in the morning in Delhi. So imagine having to wait hours just to use the toilet. So how do we fix this? How do we fix this? Because innovation is based on optimism. We wouldn't innovate if we weren't optimistic that we could actually fix these things. So at Circle of Blue, our goal is to get out in the field, tell the big stories, use the superheroes in journalism, science, data, design, to tell the important stories, to get on the front lines and figure out what's going on. Put a face to it. So we started out in a couple of years ago in the Tehuacan Valley of Mexico. This is a microcosm of really the water crisis. So here we have a community in Tehuacan where rainfall was decre decreasing. So this is a, a watering hall called the Yagüe, where they water their, their, uh, their animals. Now they use it for drinking water and they use it for cooking and for bathing. 
But we also found factory farms. These are pig and chicken farms down valley from the Yagwe. The Yagwe is further up valley that are pumping water constantly, 24 seven from 14 inch wells. The wells pump, they flow through, the effluent pushes out the other side and literally just flows into the field 24 seven. We walked into these factories, nobody was there except just us and the pigs and the chickens. But then there's a bright spot. We run into people like, like these farmers whose wells for the first time in their recorded history have gone dry and they're taking it to the next level. They're saying, we need to fix this. They're working with the community to fix this. And people like Francisca Rosa Valencia. Now Francisca is one of my personal heroes because we spent, a whole, we spent two days with her and she lives in one of those little villages up above near that Yagüe. And we asked her about her stories. We asked her about her life and her community and her family. And one of, the big, one of the big questions, let me see here if I can get to the next one. There we go. So we were sitting, the last question, we had a television crew with me, photographer, and we'd done this great story about her changing the community and also um, planting amaranth, which is a much more drought resistant crop. So they're becoming more resilient. They're taking their corn. Instead of planting corn, they're planting amaranth. They're creating a whole new market for this grain. So the last question we asked, and I tried try to remember that, that little listening tip. The last question we asked, camera's rolling. I said, Francisca, and I, I, through a translator, my Spanish wasn't good enough, but tell me, what is this doing to your family? What does this mean to you and your family, this being the drought, this being your wells going dry? And then we let the camera roll for a minute, almost two minutes. And you can imagine the silence if I stood here and didn't speak for two minutes. You'd be, uh, pretty, pretty concerned. Um, and she reached over and she picked up a picture. And this is a picture of her son. And then she started to cry. And then she said, my son has left. More than a year ago, my son left the village because there was no economy, no water, no future. Where did he go? He went north. He went to Mexico City. Then he went to the US and she hadn't heard from him in more than a year. So she never learned, at least last we checked in with her uh, three years ago, if her son actually made it to the US. So she never learned, but here, if we listen, we can already listen to the sound of people moving, the sound of immigration, and also the sound of economies changing at the front lines of this water crisis. In Australia, the Murray-Darling Basin a few years ago, you remember the great fires and the drought. So we were there right before the fires, but right in the middle of the massive drought. So a massive drought that actually started to reframe how Australia's Murray-Darling Basin manages its water, an entire water management system now that's automated, basically. Because of situations like this, they were growing rice basically in the desert. When we were up in the air, I took this picture, I hit the GPS button, and then we landed at a nearby airport and went over and found this farmer. And his complaint was he had to drill his well deeper every year so he could continue growing rice in the desert. Um, that, I can guarantee you, has changed since then. One journalist told us that we interviewed, one journalist told us that she was afraid to go on the air and do another story about the drought because she was afraid, was afraid that her story would cause another farmer to take his own life. The situation was that bad. Her bosses told her, her editors told her that she should, that she should tone back her reporting a little bit and not cover this drought quite as much because it was, it was potentially causing people to take their own lives. And you can imagine the pressure on a reporter to do that, a real story unfolding. But then we run into people like Beryl Carmichael, an Aboriginal elder um, in the Murray-Darling Basin, whose dream time is based all along walking along these rivers, these ancient rivers, and their ties to their history, and their ties to water management. So what we can learn from people like Beryl Carmichael, sitting around the campfire eating roasted kangaroo, um, and learning about how they've cared for their community, how they've cared for their land and their spirit. So the Murray-Darling Basin has changed, and it'd be fun, I'm sure, for a, a session sometime in the future to learn how Australia re-engineered not only its, its plumbing systems, but really its governance systems. This is a little bit about what, what the Murray-Darling systems look like. So we wanted to ask some simple questions, and what does water and energy mean in China? Here's the world's fastest growing economy. How is water and energy shaping a nation? We like to ask simple questions and take on simple projects, so we took on China from Michigan. <laughs> um, 
So flying into Xilinha, Inner Mongolia, um, our team, first off, our team was, was covering this issue across Beijing, and they sent me to Inner Mongolia in December. It was 25 below zero. Um, I should have brought a few more layers, but flying into Xilinha, this is what I could see. This is one of the giant open coal pits, one of the largest in China. And off in the distance, you can't see it here, but was a little tiny farmhouse, and I instructed the only cab at the Xilinghat airport, my driver, <laughs> to take me to this little tiny farmhouse. And there I met Wu Yun, the daughter of Mongolian shepherds. And she was outstanding in her, in her dry field there. Um, and the coal mines are in the background. So you can see those little buttes, one on each side of her. And that's the tractor they now have to use to pull water tanks and drive 15 kilometers to get water because the coal mines have drained the water table and the reduced rainfall patterns. So there's the coal mine, coal mine number one, coal mine number two, her, her well, the dry well, and the tractor, in case you missed it. So we have three trends converging in China. I mentioned the nexus of water, food, and energy. We have this nexus converging in China, and it is shaping a nation, and it's also rippling through markets around the world. We found that China does not have enough water to continue mining and processing its coal at current levels. Now, you can imagine what that means to a, a global, basically, a global economic driver. If they can't run their power plants, how can we get our iPods? These are decisions worth hundreds of billions of dollars, and China is facing this right now. They're facing a very dry north, which is where their coal is, and a wet south. So how do they move that water from south to north? Well, China likes to do things in big, big ways. They build transfer projects. They're spending more than $100 billion right now moving water from the south to the north in the south-north water transfer project. A lot of that water will be for Beijing, but a lot of that water, huge, huge processes, projects will be to bring water north to the coal mines, just to the coal mines. And this is what the tunnels look like that go under the Yellow River, move the Yangtze water up north. I think we were the first Westerners actually in this tunnel. So also, what does that mean for global markets? China then starts to offshore their water footprint. So they start to move their water footprint, their coal footprint to Australia, which then affects, of course, the, uh, the water tables there and the farming and irrigation capabilities. So then also we have China is, is very, very much a dam builder. And as you see here, this is the Longtan power station near Vietnam. Its generation capacity due to declining water flows down 30% in 2009, down almost 60% in the first quarter in 2010. Really interesting to note is because a lot of their water supplies for their dams is projected to decline or is declining, they're building coal plants next to the dams in case the dams go dry or aren't able to generate power. So their backup systems near their dams are coal plants. Fascinating. That was Urumqi, sorry, we'll, we'll keep moving here, but that's Urumqi near the Kazakh border. Urumqi's new, huge, multi, multi-billion dollar fabrication plants and, and uh, mills and whatnot require water. That water is coming from glacial melt in the hills and mountains not far away. Well, our folks at the, at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and the scientists there tell us that there is not much water left there. The glaciers are receding. So they're investing in a very, very dry future. Where will they get their water? So we know that we have complexities that are outpacing our abilities to deal. But some of the bright spots, what happens when we bring water to a community? It's really exciting. This is in Manila, in the village of, in the, in the uh, squatter village, I guess you could call it, in the slum of Quattro. So I went and stayed the night there. And about 4 a.m., I could hear people. I could hear people moving. It wasn't the usual angst that you feel, say, in, in central Mexico City in the really poor neighborhoods. Instead, people were setting up uh, setting up little market booths like this vegetable seller here on the streets in the, in the really poor area of Cuatro. This little, uh, this is Pasita's store. And this is, this is probably about 4.30, 5, 5 o'clock in the morning, setting up for the day to open, just like any other part of the, of the city, except it's in one of the poorest parts of the city. What's the difference? The difference is, well, of course, we, we still have sewage that runs under, underfoot, but the difference here is 
these little blue pipes. So Manila has, is testing some really interesting ways of bringing water to other communities through privatization and partnerships with the communities. So this community manages its own water supply from Manila water through these little blue pipes. The people pay for it, but the, but the transformation has been amazing. People are healthier, the children are healthier, they're playing in the streets, they're actually able to bathe. And little boys like Omar, this nine-year-old boy like Omar, who sells fish at dawn, he's able to actually work, raise a little bit of money for his family, and then go to school for the first time. Before, his full-time job was working as a beggar in the streets of Manila. So now, because this community has water that's safe to drink, children like Omar are actually getting an education. So it's absolutely transformative. Those little blue pipes can transform an entire community. It's, un it's really, really exciting. But when we talk about data and we talk about these, these really, really big challenges, sometimes the simplest data is underfoot, um, or sometimes we're walking in it. So we just did a, uh, a scoping trip to India to look at doing a much bigger project there. And just, a, just a, little, a little tease here, one of the biggest challenges India has, of course, is governance and in uh, uh, entitlements for farmers where they get free electricity. This is groundwater that's pumped from underground and flood irrigated, and they're flood irrigating winter wheat, which really in this situation doesn't need to be irrigated. But it's very, very proud of the irrigation channels. And so they let their pumps run 24 seven. So it's a great story. So watch Circle of Blue for it coming up um, in April. So how do we put this data together? So we as journalists, we collect data, we collect stories, we work with scientists. Um, we also design the data, the information. We like to think of our, our information as part of that data set. Pixels can come as data. So how do, you, how do you make the world just a click away? Is it just a click away, I think is a big question. And how do we peek into the future? So in hearing about the smarter planet, we're on the front line. So we like to see ourselves like the Canadian, like the, uh, the water network here. Um, as part of the sense, sensing and listening, this is you guys in an era of extreme data collection and total mass collaboration with the little with the, with the whacker tubes last night. Um, so we can all we can all take joy in the data and telling these stories. Um, but what happens to that? So this is part that I think plugs in really nicely with what IBM is doing. Is on the front lines we collect a lot of data, and we'll be we'll be launching this project um, further down the road because we as journalists we run across scientists, people who just never been asked for their data for their say data on water and en energy in Ningxia Province. We ran into one professor who's 20 years of work. Nobody had ever asked him for. And he'd been studying this interplay between water and energy and energy and water. And it was sitting on the shelf, just right there. All he had to do was copy it. He brought it to our hotel at 5.30 in the morning. So we want to be able to pull in, in a sense, optimize our data collection so that we can plug into this much larger data flow that's happening around the world. We call it choke point index. And just some of the simple data sets, data, data tools we can use is just create simple dashboards that also feed back into much more analytical, much bigger systems. But these are some of the things, examples of what we've been able to do. So I want to take a few more minutes and is the world just a click away or not? And what do we face as a storyteller? What's our big challenge? We face arch enemies, any superhero. You can't be a superhero unless you face arch enemies, right? These are enemies that are ruthless, they're evil, and they're cold. Um, and here are a few, a few of them. Um, remember, <laughs> remember Muammar Gaddafi? Now, I'm from the US. I don't know if, we, if everybody knows who that is, but that's, that's uh, of course, Charlie Sheen. And if anybody can tell me um, which quote goes with which face, um, we'll come up with some sort of water award. Whoop, I went back here. Come back, come back with that quote. Anyway, the quote was both from Charlie Sheen. Um, <laughs> So that's the challenge we face is, oh, here, he's going to play it again. Uh, the challenge we face is we're up against these evildoers. These are the evildoers. And we're also up against ourselves. What's the news that we are tuned into? This is a, this is a couple months ago. So when I, I was looking at the news, I said, you know, what are we competing against when we're telling these water stories? And here we're competing against Bush was eating souffle when Obama called about bin Laden. That was a headline. We're competing against... Azerbaijan in the first ever Eurovision triumph. Okay, so we have 40,000 scientists working on water data. How do we get the stories through this clutter? 
huge challenge. And I really challenge all of us when we look at challenges and, and collaborative opportunities. Let's pick that one up. Um, I have to show this one too. One more example. Everybody remembers Brad and Angelina and the Brad Angelina baby. Um, so anybody, anybody, just a couple words about the mainstream media, just three people, just one word. Mainstream media, at least in the US. I always like to say underpaid, underappreciated, um, lack of trust, narrow. OK, great. So we could, we could use a whole sheets of paper to fill this up. But I like to point out that this baby picture is pretty famous because our photographer, Brent Sturton, World Press winner, is photographing in Tehuacan the Tehuacan Valley of Mexico, photographing Francisca, photographing the Yagues, photographing this whole community for two weeks. Then he disappeared. And we figured out where he was going. And it was to Namibia, to Vintuk, Namibia, to a private coach to photograph the Bragelina baby. And how much did People Magazine pay for that picture? The most expensive cover picture in history taken off of our assignment. 10 million, that'd be $10 million. <laughs> Not billion, $10 million. We didn't get any of that. That money did go to charity, but that's what People Magazine paid. So how do we bust through this? And we better bust through it in a hurry. This is our Indiana Jones moment. It really is to reach in through the snake pit and grab our hat and run. Because you remember Wu Yun. So I went back this year. That was two years ago. I went back this year. This is the view out of her front door now. This is a year later. Of course, it's, it's summertime. But this is the view out of her front door now. And a two-hour motorcycle away to Wu Yun's sister's in-laws, Gur, a little little Gur on the prairie. Um, the the uh, the front lines of the of the water crisis are really really evident. Um, the sheep, the grazing the grazing lands for the sheep are drying up. I got up really early in the morning at 4:30, and I found myself standing on this on this kind of dusty knoll. And she came out at sunrise and stood up there. This is that dotted line of desertification you see marching across Inner Mongolia on the maps. There it was. There was the actual line of these sand dunes. So we need to go from systemic failure to systemic future. And how do we do that? Well, I think we're all superheroes here. And I was really, really disappointed, though, when I got, I think, the next year as I figured out I was just wearing long underwear and a Speedo bathing suit. But I knew where to find the superheroes. And I'm really excited that they're right here and that there are superheroes all around the world. So thank you very much.